time span. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, start this webinar today. My name is Joseph Bahut. I'm the director of the Isam Faris uh, Institute for Public Affairs and International Affairs at the uh, AUB, American University of Beirut. And we're having today a very timely uh, webinar on governance, uh, public sector reform in the MENA region, and uh, especially in the context of 10 years after the Arab Revolution. Um, I'll, I'll be brief in introducing this webinar because we have uh, very rich uh, content and topics to cover and very uh, knowledgeable speakers with us today. Uh, just to say that we've been probably living for the circle. Uh, the lack of uh, uh, enough reform and uh, the deficit in, in public uh, governance in the Arab world has uh, rendered uh, around 2010, uh, 2011 Arab uprisings almost inevitable because people were really asking for uh, better social goods delivery, uh, for better accountability, for better transparency. Um, so uh, this led probably that these are the deep root causes of uh, the Arab uprising. But also the Arab uprisings have highlighted the necessity to undergo these reforms and at the same time rendered them more difficult because uh, the duress and the tension and the pressure that was put on Arab systems uh, was very high and very strong. So we were living in a kind of race between reform and public discontent. Uh, during these last 10 years also, uh, we had several constraints that came to add up to this uh, landscape. Uh, the decrease, the sharp decrease in oil prices, the almost end of uh, the rentier state economy, uh, plus then in the last two years, the COVID-19 epidemic, all this uh, came to add uh, additional and supplementary weight on uh, the systems that were uh, needing uh, reform. Uh, during this time, however, there were several uh, attempts at reforming governance, at reforming public sectors. There were some uh, very small, very partial, sometimes sectorial success stories. Uh, however, at, uh, in a global vision, we can say today that the MENA region is still uh, lacking uh, public good delivery, lacking transparency, lacking uh, reform, and lacking, of course, uh, sound and good and viable uh, governance. Uh, what has been achieved during these last 10 years, but more importantly, maybe how was it achieved? What were the methods uh, that were put in at play? What were the impediments? What are the lessons learned? This is exactly what we are uh, going to spend an hour and, and 15 minutes talking about. And for this, we are very happy uh, today to partner at IFI with our uh, friendly counterpart, a brother uh, center in Doha, the Brookings Center, uh, represented here by two uh, prestigious scholars, uh, Tariq Yusuf, the director of the center, and Robert Bechel, a senior fellow at the center. And the reason why we have partnered with uh, the Brookings uh, Institute in Doha uh, for this event is that the Brookings Institute in Doha has just published a very timely and very precious uh, book that is in fact uh, the subject maybe of our discussion, public reform, uh, public sector reform in the MENA region. It's a book that is co-edited by uh, Tariq Youssef, who's on screen, and Robert Bechel. And in this book, we have a series exactly of reviews of these attempts to uh, reform the public sector in the Arab world, and also a review of the successes and the shortage, short, shortcomings of these uh, attempts to, uh, to reform. So uh, in order to have this discussion around not only the book, but the book as a pretext for the discussion, we are very lucky to have a prestigious lineup of scholars. We have with us uh, Minister Hala uh, Latouf Psaisu, who was herself a Minister of Social Development in Jordan, leading uh, very strongly and very importantly uh, parts of the government's reform in Jordan, not only through her ministry, but uh, trying to reform the, the overall governance system of the country. 
Dr. Latouf is a, a former uh, civil servant, but also a representative of Jordan's, uh, uh, let's say, society, because she was also a former senator in the Majlis Ashuyukh of the Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, so I think that the experience of Dr. Latouf will be uh, utmostly important for us to understand so uh, some of the concrete attempts at reforming public sectors. We also have with us uh, Rami Khouri, our friend Rami Khouri, who is a well-known long-time editorialist, well-known in the Arab world and in, in, in Western newspapers. Uh, Rami Khouri was uh, formerly the director of IFI, so I'm, I'm very uh, honored and lucky to succeed him at the head of this institution. Today, Rami is the director of AUB's Center for Global Engagement in uh, New York and is also a fellow at Harvard's uh, John F. Uh, Kennedy School of Government. Of course, we have with us uh, Tariq Youssef in his quality of director of the Brooking uh, Doha. Uh, but, but more importantly, the main co-editor of, of this book I mentioned. And Tariq is uh, not only the director of the Brooking Doha Center, but also a professor of Arab politics at Georgetown uh, University. And uh, last but definitely not least, we have uh, Robert Bechel, who's also the other co-editor of this book, who's a senior fellow of the, at the Brookings Doha Institute, but also uh, formerly who headed uh, the Center for uh, Government Reform and Government Affairs at uh, the World Bank. So we have a very prestigious and very rich lineup of speakers, and they will be, I think, uh, very interesting, interesting to, uh, to hear, shedding a light on this crucial uh, topic. Without further ado, I will uh, uh, give the floor to uh, Minister uh, to Rami, maybe first, in order for him to, uh, in a way, give us the broader landscape 10 years after the Arab uprisings and uh, this nexus between uh, popular discontent, social upheaval, and the need for uh, Arab uh, public uh, systems and their lack of, of reform. Rami, 10 years after, uh, where are we today in this question? Uh, what uh, can we say? Is the cycle of Arab revolution definitely over? Are the root causes of these uprisings, meaning the lack of governance, uh, all we know about the shortcomings of Arab political system uh, behind us, or only this is a pause and we're going to witness probably a new cycle of upheaval because in a way, structurally, nothing has been uh, solved or changed. Uh, I'll give you the floor, each of you, for five to seven minutes and then we'll have a second round of discussion. Rami, please. Thank you, Joe. And it's great to be with uh, many friends uh, and colleagues. And uh, in five to seven minutes, that's about three sentences in the Arab world, but I will try to be succinct and clear. Um, the this moment now in the Arab world, I feel, uh, is probably the most significant one in the entire last century of modern Arab statehood across most of the region. And that's because this is the moment now where for the first time ever in the last century, where we've seen simultaneously popular expression of both discontent and demand for proper citizenship by majorities of people across the region. Uh, the polling of the Arab Center in Doha that just came out recently shows that somewhere between uh, 60 and 80 percent, uh, average of 70, 75 of people across the entire Arab world support the uh, uprisings, the revolutions, the demonstrations, the protests. Um, that's significant. The second significant thing is that most of the protests, as we see in the continuing ones in Algeria, uh, Sudan, Lebanon, and Iraq, and there's others that are ongoing but low key, but the continuing ones all have exactly the same demands. They want a complete change in the government system. Uh, they want complete change in the people running their governments. Um, and more importantly, they want a relationship between the citizen and the state that is more satisfactory to both the citizen and the state. The central story that the Arab world has experienced, I think, in the last century has been the uh, roller coaster ride uh, of effective and stable and satisfying statehood. 
Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. It was pretty impressive between 1920 and 1970, what happened in the Arab world, uh, with incredible development uh, services, uh, pr productivity, people's quality of life, school, uh, health care, jobs. It was an amazing burst of development that we can all be very proud of. And the states did pretty good job. And that was before the massive oil boom period. But from the 1980s until today, we've had stagnation, regression, warfare, fragmentation, disintegration, sectarianism, tribalism, and uh, some terrorism, and a lot of immigration of our brightest young people. So there's a problem today. And the problem is in the relationship between the citizen and the state. And if you look at the protests, not just the last 10 years, but the last 40 years, which most of us have lived through, uh, from the mid-1970s until today, we've seen constant protests, whether it's about milk prices or electricity quality or, or job availability, whatever it may be, but the protests of citizens have been steady, but have been mostly ignored, and mostly. Um, and the important thing now is to look at what are citizens asking for? What do they want? And besides changing the government, having better government, they want better services from the state, they want less uh, corruption, and they want to be uh, they want their voice to be heard. They want to have dignity in their life as citizens and as, as human beings. When we're in a situation as we are now, where somewhere around 75% of all people in the Arab world are not able to cover their basic monthly expenses. I mean, that's an extraordinary figure. You take away the oil states, the rich states, you're talking about somewhere like 80, 85% of most Arabs uh, are poor and vulnerable and marginalized and politically helpless. So that's where we are. We're in a very difficult situation. And that's why there's wars and immigration and people wanting, uh, uh, wanting to leave and all of these issues. That's the bad news. <clears throat> but it helps us understand that the issue of state reform is a central issue. It's not just something that pinheaded intellectuals, as George Wallace used to call them, <laughs> pinheaded intellectuals sit and discuss in their academic uh, uh, class uh, uh, or, or research uh, uh, efforts, S uh, reform of the state is the central political and human dynamic that must be addressed in the Arab world. The good news is that we've seen examples of Arab countries who've done this. Uh, Hala has been one of the people among many others in the, in the region who've done this. And I've experienced it in Lebanon and Jordan, uh, in Palestine and other places where I've lived. I've seen state reform happen. Uh, when you go in Jordan and try to renew your driving license, you think you're in a Swiss bakery. It's unbelievable. It's so efficient. It's so clean. It's so fast. It's so um, um, uncorruptible. If we, when you go to try to pay your taxes for real estate in Lebanon, it's really hard uh, to to be corrupt if you if you want to be. You can't because it's all computerized and there's no there's very little human interaction. So we know that the state can reform. The question is, why doesn't it do it more often? Uh, and, and what is the relationship between the citizen and the state uh, that can uh, make reform uh, happen? Uh, this, is, of course, is what this wonderful uh, book is all about. And, and, and Tara and, and Bob will talk to us more about that. And Hala will give us some insights about the, the being a practitioner of, of uh, uh, officialdom and, uh, and reform uh, at the same time. But I think that we are. We, we, and I'll end by, by saying we need to really understand the protest movement of the last 40 years as being a cry for citizenship among nationals of countries who've been denied that citizenship. And it's not just about re technical reforms and corruption. It really, and I say it's the most important moment in modern Arab history because this is really the first example that I feel we can say is truly a pro an attempt for uh, national self-determination by the citizens of these countries, which has never happened before. Most of these most of these countries were set up either by retreating colonial powers or local elites working with the colonial powers. We've never had the citizenries implement the principle of the consent of the governed, and now they're trying to figure out how to do that. They haven't succeeded very much, but this is what this is all about, and the central issue remains the reform of the state in its relationship with the citizenry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rami. We'll come back to, to all of this. I think it was important to have 
the, the, the historical background and, and the historic span of, of attempts to reform and the, the issue of public sector at, at, in general and at large. You mentioned during your, your, uh, your minutes of intervention uh, the experience and, and the person of, of Halal Atuf who's with us and we're lucky to have her. Uh, Minister Latouf, you were uh, in the middle of, of this pipeline of this, uh, you were at the helm partially at least in uh, a very uh, important experience of, of uh, attempt to reform the Jordanian public sector and the government sector. Uh, what can you tell us about this experience? What, what was achieved first? How was it achieved? Uh, what were the methods uh, you used? And second, why the rest was not achieved? What was not achieved and why wasn't it achieved? Was it a problem of, of structural construction of the political system? Is it a problem of society response? What are the lessons that we can uh, draw from your experience? Uh, thank you, Joe, and, and thank you, Rami, uh, for setting really uh, the stage for me to re reiterate the importance of reform. Um, they always say, when they ever re refer to our um, Arab countries, they always speak about democracy. And I always say democracy is not just an election law. It's good government. It's good providing services for all. It's good citizenship. But it doesn't get that much attention. And I think our experience has shown that without reform, we are, we're not even staying where we are. We're going backwards. Uh, in my view, there are two kinds of reform. Most people focus on the administrative reform, the procedures, getting things done, the efficiency, the career path. And there's the hidden or the more difficult reform is the values. When we are reforming, speaking about Ministry of Social Development, what are we saying when you're running an institution? Are we doing it on a social justice, human rights approach? Because they translate into the procedures you're going to do and the kind of services you're going to do. Um, this is usually the most difficult because if you have that right, then the procedures, even if the employees do it, it comes by itself. Most of the books that you read about reform, they focus on the first one. And it's very important because the second one, if you want to come to a country and say, we were going to look at their values, is a very personal things that usually countries and citizens do them their own selves. But it does. I, I fully agree with Ram when he said, I, I had a sentence written here that reform is the, sets the platform for the relationship, just and fair relationship between the government, the states, and its citizenship. Reform, it says who gets the services, how, and who is accountable. So we have done some reform. Some has been, has been easier than others. I think the difficult part, and, and I, I have checks and lists, I've you know, main ideas for any reform, if you want to do it, what worked with the ministry, because it was small, a smaller part. On a, on, a, on a government part, political reform was the most challenging one. And we always say about, but sometimes, to be honest, looking back, I think you can, sometimes if you're too holistic and you do judicial reform, political reform, administrative reform, you might lose everything. So I would focus on what I can do. I would, it's very important, the timing, how you communicate it and what you are reforming. And not only the low hanging fruit, everybody's sick of the low hanging fruit. You have to go to the structural basis of what is wrong. To do that, definitely you need very strong leadership. You need leaders who are charismatic and who can promise you something better and who make it a national priority. It is for the good of the country. It's not because we want to lessen the expenses and we want to more efficient government and more in lean services. That too, but at the end of the day, it's the future of the country. If they do not give that importance to reform as it should, because it is really heading the future, I'm not so sure it will go um, a long way because most of the people working in the government and the states are benefiting from the system that is based on meritocracy and for them being there. So they're not gonna make it easy to reform because their whole existence and is on debt and power is within that. And the second thing, I think it's very important that you can't do reform alone unless you build the dynamics for it and you build enough movement for it, it will not be sustained. How you do that? By making everybody working in the public sector feel that they are important. When, we, when I started with the ministry, and we did lots of reform, especially in more a human rights-based approach to working with juvenile, and I really, I fully agree with on poverty. 
poverty is the first violation of human rights. It is the first, you know, SDG, MDG, but yet we, we don't have the figures and we don't work with it in holistic form because you have to reform to be able to solve government to give better uh, services. You start with your staff. They're not going to do reform if they feel they have injustice system and they have uh, things that they need to be addressed. So you work with them. You try to resolve what they have. Things you cannot do, but even the ones you cannot, if they see you try and fail once, twice, you might get 50%. They know you're, you're at their side. So I think you cannot do anything without having the civil servant at an old stage. And what I don't like is usually it's a top bottom, but you'd, you'd be surprised how powerful are the civil servants in the fields. So, and then you have to know your ministry. You cannot reform what you do not know. If you do know how it functions, you don't, the informal culture sometimes is as important as the formal because it gives you the leeway. So first, a government is like a machine. You want to go there, it kind of lets you go there. If you do not fix the machine, you have to know how it works. So when you get somebody outsider from the government, that's very good, but they have to work with somebody who knows the system to do what. One thing I'd like to do to say is that you work on organizational issue, but you have to make sure for some reason, when you they draw the boxes, I really hate organizational structures with boxes. Staff believe that they actually live in that box. They cannot communicate. So I would rebuild the team. You have to have exciting energy to pull difficult staff, to make it long hours work. You need that excitement, that sense of urgency. So when you have these team structures, formal, informal, it helps a lot. And you need to have your back uh, protected because you will have lots of people who will not benefit from reform. So for me, having the prime minister or the prime minister having all the political sphere is very important, especially right now with social media. The staff work from eight to five, eight to three, eight to six, and the social media and the fake news is 24 hours. You do not have the equipment. You don't have the abilities to really to be able to work with the negative fallout of whoever is going to fight the reform. So we are, it's really not a fair game for a public servant who, you know, I had to, my husband, my, every, all my friends, everybody helped me out to be able to make the case and the staff were the first line of defense for the government. We were able to double the budget of the ministry from, well, although there was no budget because they showed the cause of the ministry is how, how strong you position yourself and you don't compromise. You don't sugarcoat things and you don't have double standards. There's a credibility issue between the citizens, even the staff of the government with the ministers. You cannot have double standards. You have to be honest and people are not stupid. We do not insult anybody's in intelligence. So it's very important that you're trans something you cannot do, you, can you say it, you cannot do. So I think it's very important to, to lay the ground of what it is. There are many challenges. What didn't work, I think, we lost a valuable, valuable opportunity to reform the government when the economy was doing better because it's easier to reform when the economy is doing better. When we link political with administrative, we were not ready for political. And I think, you know, looking back, I think that was not my doing, but I think that's a shame. We did good things of reforming the, the decision-making body, how much time the, 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 the ministers uh, really spent on policy how the decisions are made. I think you could do that, but at the end of the day, if you don't reform how the government work, I think if anything, the pandemic showed us more than the Arab Spring, is that you cannot hide behind anything. What doesn't work, doesn't work. If the health system is not good, if the education system is not good, there's no hiding. And partnerships are important, but at the end of the day, what do you have nationally is what's going to help you. And I think they realize, realize having good health system, education, agriculture, working on science, it's, it's not, it's not in technology, you know, medicines and all of that showed us it's important. So while I agree, it's very difficult, right? I hope we can embed reform in our response to the pandemic. If we don't, I think we're back to ground zero or minus because we're, it, you can go backwards if you don't properly reform. I hope I didn't take much time. No, no, that was perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Latouf. I'll, I'll get back to you and challenge you on, on some of the points you've raised in, in the second round. Now I would like to turn uh, to, to you, Tarek. Uh, I mean, you're, you're the co-author of, of this book and you're also a, a professor of, of Arab politics at Georgetown. Uh, 
you're a, a long time connoisseur of things in the Arab world. In this book, you, uh, both you and Robert, uh, you cover several case studies. We're not in a theoretical approach here. We're talking about concrete things. You, you've, took, you've taken some uh, six to seven case studies of attempts of reform national or partial and sectorial, and you, you, you dwelled, you, you plunged into the experience and you took lessons, what worked, what didn't work, etc. You've covered in your, in your book cases like Jordan, we just heard uh, Halal Atouf now talking about it. Uh, you've also uh, tackled on the Palestinian Authority, on Morocco, on Dubai, uh, which is maybe today the best case of success with the e-government and etc. Uh, you even tackled Lebanon, which is uh, maybe uh, the, the, the most, let's say, uh, despairing case in terms of public reform. And cases like Tunisia, where we have a, a relative success story in terms of democratic transition. Uh, if you have to choose one case of success and one case of utter failure uh, of all these uh, in this portfolio, uh, which one would you choose and what, what can you tell us about it? Can I call a friend? Jordan? We're all friends here, but uh, I, I'm not sure we'll be of any help. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I can call Robert. I see him in front of me. And uh, I will direct this question to him and perhaps come up and, and follow up on, on, on some other things. So if that's okay with you, I'm calling a friend, Robert. Okay, thanks. Um, Robert, you're, you're, it's your turn to win the million dollar box now. <laughs> Um, I think, um, let me respond narrowly to the question you raised, and then there are some other issues that we can swing back to later in the, in the discussion. But um, I, the case that I, I, I thought was a wonderful success was Jordan and the passport reform. I mean, Rami alluded to that earlier. This was largely a homegrown effort. You didn't have legions of World Bank consultants or McKinsey lined up to give advice. Uh, this was the passion of a few Jordanian reformers who came into a situation that was really dysfunctional. Uh, and as Rami and Hala can uh, attest, turned it into uh, working like a Swiss watch. I mean, it was really a very impressive homegrown set of reforms. A lot of things that they did, it, it was a complicated set of issues, business process re-engineering, sort of separating out various dimensions of service delivery. There were some HR issues that need to be addressed and organizational structuring issues, but it's a, it's a wonderful case. I, I think that the greatest failure uh, is also one of the most interesting and instructive, and that was the HR reforms in Lebanon. There was a very serious effort to try to interject meritocracy uh, into the Lebanese public sector, and uh, you took meritocracy up against a traditional confessional system, and uh, I mean, that battle was over in half a round. I mean, and it was a knockout. Uh, but, but a fascinating case that raises, raises all sorts of issues. My own view, and I'll come back to this later in our discussion, uh, is that HR reforms are one of the areas where the region tends to struggle most. And, and, and I don't see any way around it. There is no high performing public sector that is not enshrined meritocracy and meritocratic practices. Uh, and so, so you need to get there, but uh, often in the region, it bumps up a, against a host of complications, uh, as was the case in Lebanon with the confessional system. Hey, maybe now it's, it's your turn, uh, Tariq, to take the challenge and, and tell us a bit more and, uh, and, and, and talk about a little bit, I mean, talk about the book a little bit and, and the, what, what you've learned and what other people who wrote it with you learned about the attempts at reforming. Thank you, Joe. Um, I think if we go back and Rami has sort of provided an historical context for why this book was written, why we commissioned those papers, why we worked with the authors and developed those case studies. Uh, if you go back to 2002, Joe, uh, the Arab Human Development Report, the focus on the governance gap in the Arab world, which became in many ways a rallying cry for intellectuals, uh, observers, analysts, and international civil servants to start focusing on governance issues uh, affecting the Arab world. 
uh, that was the context in which many of these, these discussions uh, emerged. Uh, I would say over the subsequent three to four years, uh, myself, Bob, and many, many others uh, uh, focused on, on these mega macro trends of good governance or bad governance. Uh, how well is the Arab world or country A was doing on transparency, accountability, e-government, uh, later on, uh, government effectiveness, bureaucratic efficiency, uh, all of this stuff. Uh, but I think very quickly, Joe, we realized that we actually lacked insider knowledge on how reforms take place in the region. So the people engaged in the reforms, such as Hala Latouf uh, and many others who are mentioned uh, by name and we worked with, from Egypt to Palestine to Morocco uh, to the Gulf. Uh, how are reforms actually conducted? Uh, what are the obstacles people face? How long does it take for reforms to actually begin to bear fruit? Uh, that was in many ways the motivation for the book, Joe. We wanted to better understand the nuts and bolts of how you engineer public sector reform in the Arab world. Um, and I was surprised, like many others, including Bob, by one, the wealth of information and the diversity of, of experience, uh, but ultimately by how uh, no different or how similar the Arab world seemed to be relative to many other experiences around the world. Meaning once we started filling the gaps to understand how reforms work, where they succeed, where they fail, uh, our broad conclusion was the Arab world is really no different. There's nothing exceptional about the public sectors of the region. Uh, there is nothing about them that is specifically uh, uh, resistant to reform, other than perhaps their complexity, their large size, their overwhelming weight, and the extensiveness of their involvement and their intervention and their intrusiveness in the societies and the polities and the economies of the Arab world in the way that Rami had alluded to. So one broad conclusion, I would say, Joe, uh, that we felt very comfortable with. Beyond that, I would say there have been a number of things, uh, broad findings that are worth highlighting uh, quickly because they also relate to what Hala had just mentioned. I, for example, initially, Joe, uh, did not expect that leadership would emerge as such an important quality for reforms. You know, many of us grew up at a time when we thought, well, reforms are not about individuals. They're about processes. They're about national visions. That, and they are about all of this. But it turns out they're actually also about leaders. Uh, a very intangible uh, quantity in some respects, but one that has had a profound impact on making reforms happen or not. It is not sufficient, but I would argue like Bob did, in many contexts it proved uh, necessary and it proved critical. Um, one conclusion. Second conclusion is uh, how leaders themselves or how reformers such as Hala and others, how they coped with opposition. You know, Hala talked earlier about, you know, the resistance you're gonna face, the resistance from within, and from outside of your own ministry. Well, how did good leaders or successful reformers cope? It turns out they deployed strategies that we tried to kind of capture. Uh, another notion that became important in, in drawing the broad lessons is, uh, how do you build credibility as a reformer? Once the resistance builds up and you become a subject of public attacks and, and media targeting, how do you build credibility within your ministry and with the public. And in this regard, we consistently found that communication, for example, consistent, transparent communication um, proved to be very important and pivotal in one, uh, allowing you to build credibility, uh, helping to establish the credibility of reforms themselves and giving you the space and, uh, and the, the necessary uh, context in which you can engineer reforms. Uh, finally, Joe, and again, thinking about the broad lessons and, and, uh, and how they matter here, uh, this notion of political will that 
often comes up in, in, in many discussions, public and academic discussions of reform in the Arab world. Well, why did the reforms take place? They had political will. Why, why didn't reforms happen? Well, they didn't have political will. Well, what is political will? And how do you unpack that? And how do you create that? So one of the lessons uh, we draw from a lot of the case studies is that this very nebulous notion of political will is much more dynamic and is much more uh, under control and one that, that reformers working, again, within parameters, uh, as Hala said, uh, reformers cannot address all, all uh, aspects of, the, of any national vision. They have to work within the confines of their ministries. They have to work often within the confines of legal frameworks. Uh, but once you unpack that political will and how you build it and how you build credibility with it becomes something much more manageable. And I would say the book uh, provides some contribution here in helping to make a very what looks like a very complicated process, one that actually uh, can be made practical pragmatic and can succeed under some context. I'll stop here, uh, Joe. Thank you again. Uh, thanks a lot, Tarek. I think you've touched upon uh, uh, millions of, uh, of very important and interesting points. I'll get back to them and probably try to spread them in, in the questions I'll, I'll, I'll now uh, put, to you, uh, put to you all in the second round. I'll start with you, uh, Hala, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, Mrs. Minister. Uh, Tarek mentioned something important about leadership and etc. You also mentioned something for me critical. Uh, you said one of the one of the main pillars of a successful reform is uh, that you can't do it alone. You have to have acceptance, uh, adherence of the public, and 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 sometimes a bit of legitimacy also to do it. This brings us to, uh, for me, a crucial question. Uh, in terms of political science, not only administrative uh, science or reform. Um, you, you've said it yourself, governance is a crucial part of democracy and the democratic process. But at the same time, as you, as you said yourself, democracy is a sine qua non condition of governance, if I understand you well, because you need to have acceptance, adherence, and etc. How can we today in the Arab world where democracy is probably as rare a good as public services and governance. How can we unpack this very touchy question? I know that we are here all working on the Arab world. We are, I mean, besides, uh, except Robert, who's maybe partly Arab now, all Arabs, but we know that this is probably the crucial question. This is the core question. Can we really envisage public sector reform, governance, uh, uh, adherence of citizens to the state of law and the rule of law without a minimum level of uh, democracy. What's your experience there? Uh, you're, you're muted, Hala. Uh, in a perfect world, we'll do all of what you said. We'll have democracy, we'll have an efficient system. Unfortunately, you have to have technical skills and political skills to try to start with your reform and it's like you put your foot in the door if you know the concept you you start with what you can and you build up when citizens learn that they have standards and it is their right to have these standards to get these services when they know that there's when they get used to the equal treatment and they have a good compliance complaint system they know their voices are heard now all of these do not have to touch on the political powers of the elite getting heard, your voice is system, if you have a complaint. On the contrary, they make them look good. It's a good system, but you have to have the systems in place for the voices to be heard and for the people to know that it is possible and it is their right. If their voices are not heard within the system, then they'll go to the streets and we see what what happened with Arab revolution or you know, up, uh, uprising. And even that did not have the results we did not because behind the thinking, there is not what we call frameworks and ways to do the changes. When I said you have to um, divide political from technical, if you cannot do political, start with the technical, start with what you can and work your way up. You cannot say, I want it all, and that's the only way I get it. And I think if you tie them together, I think you should have judicial reform 
definitely if you don't have just a system you didn't even speak about that then then everything will be much more difficult you have administrative reform public sector reform and political reform but my point is in a perfect world in a textbook you know when you could do four but in reality you can't pick and choose your 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 battles and the government likes to look good no matter who is the prime minister if the if you start providing services that are better for the citizens health education that are equal they will look good they will get more political clout they'll be encouraged to have more voices heard about them and to give more power to people to be heard so but it is and right now with the world is becoming so small i don't think the governments can not afford not to provide better services and really look at the most vulnerable people in a, in, in a community I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, of course it does, but it's also a little bit, uh, let me let me say it frankly, frustrating because you, I mean, this is an exercise in accepting uh, limitations and frustration. And as we say, there's a French proverb that says that uh, the better is the, sometimes the enemy of the good. So, uh, so we have to opt for uh, something good, even even though it's not the best thing we can have. And and this is. This is probably one of the main, let's say, philosophical takeaways of reform. Yes, you wanted to say something. But I didn't mean we don't work on political reform, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. But we do not link it to the public yeah. sector reform. My issue is when it is linked, public okay. sector reform. And then it, but I really believe you, you need to work on more community level, municipality level reform that's more acceptable. You need to work on the people being voices and, and structures coming to the decision making. So by all means, I would look at political reform and do it within the participatory approach of the people as a very, as, as, as a very strong notion, but in a parallel sphere. So if something gets, um, if you have any problem, then you can hold a bit, but you don't hold reform. And for, for doing public sector reform, the difficulty is you need to have both technical and political skills. You need all the skills that you can, communication yeah. skills, and, and this is, get allies. This, by the way, it's, it's a very fascinating question on uh, certain cases like Lebanon today. You know, this whole debate about technocrats and uh, people, consultants, in fact, that you bring into the political system as if they were reforming a, a corporation in Sweden or elsewhere. And if they are not enough political, they often fail because they, they will first confront the system, the, the, the culture, the, 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 the environment, and et cetera. And this is a fascinating question. I mean, this nexus between the politics and uh, the administrative. And, and as you say, and I think this is maybe one of the takeaways, incremental approaches of maybe small scale democratic experiences on the local level is maybe the start, not only of a sound uh, reform, uh, administrative reform, but maybe of also a, a long term political reform. We'll get back to that uh, uh, a bit. I would like to turn to Rami again. Uh, another uh, very tricky articulation also like i mean governance and democracy but also governance and economics uh, and hala also alluded to that by saying and and also tarek and robert by saying that reform is always easier when you have uh, uh, let's say uh, affluence i mean economic uh, economic prosperity it is always more difficult when you have duress and and uh, and direness uh, it's not a, a coincidence, probably, that the Arab up high, uh, uprising started in 2010 when, we, uh, when the Arab economies reached uh, the end of a cycle, the end of the rentier state uh, able to give uh, forever. Uh, okay, so, so this is exactly another conundrum also, this, this, this articulation between economic uh, affluence and prosperity or richness and uh, the, the capacity or incapacity of, of reforming. Today, with uh, the, the very dramatic situation of Arab systems all around, uh, the, the plunging oil prices, probably the end of the oil uh, importance for a long while, if not forever, uh, COVID, the high employment rate, uh, uh, unemployment rates, and etc. Uh, can, can we say that reform is doomed again today in 2021? 
And we are back to square one to 2010. And uh, do we have to foresee a new cycle of of popular discontent and social upheaval in the Arab world. And how to close this vicious circle, how, how to break this vicious circle? I think we have a lot of evidence over the years um, about how governments and citizens can work together in an orderly way for a transformation that satisfies everybody and creates stable, dignified, um, and uh, equitable uh, societies. Um, and one of them, uh, Hela mentioned it, I think, or Bob, I can't remember, um, the issue of communication. Um, I remember reading in the 1980s, when I was doing research on poverty and uh, change, some World Bank reports way back saying that the, the East Asian miracle, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, all of those, one of the keys to their success was that the leaderships told the people exactly what they were doing. They said, you're gonna tighten your belts. Um, we don't have democracies. We're gonna uh, spend on social services. You're gonna get schooling and education and jobs uh, and you've gotta work hard and the work future will be better. So that was one of the keys that was identified way back then. And, and it remains, the, I think, a key today in the Arab uh, countries. People don't rebel because they're poor. They rebel because they're mistreated by their own governments. It used to be they rebelled because they were mistreated by colonial uh, occupiers um, or uh, uh, colonial expansionists like you have in Israel and Palestine and, uh, and South Lebanon before. Uh, but now it's mostly domestic indignities uh, implemented by the people of those countries. Cruel governments, cruel and uncaring governments in many places, not all places, uh, who essentially allow three quarters of the country to go and take care of itself, and they deal with one quarter of the country, which is their supporters. And this is where political economy comes in, where the people who benefit, the rentier the capitalists and others, um, um, the uh, people who make money from being close to the government, uh, this is what happened. From, from what happened in the, ninth, in the critical decade was 75 to 85, when autocratic Arab regimes that were mostly militaries who took power in Iraq and Syria and Libya and Yemen and Mauritania and Tunisia and everywhere, when military uh, autocrats combined with the massing, massive amounts of money coming out of the oil expansion in the 1970s, when those two things came together, uh, you then had authoritarian and largely inefficient and ultimately very corrupt governments. And that's what led to the situation today in the last 15, 20 years, when people are, are rebelling, uh, and not because they're poor, but because they're mistreated. So the critical element, I think, to get out of it, as you, you asked what, I think the critical element is hope. Ordinary citizens must feel that there is a hope for a better life. It's, and as Hala said, it's not gonna happen quickly it's gonna happen incrementally. And some Arab governments have understood this and tried to deal with issues that impact people's daily life, a better bus system, a, a job training for uh, people who didn't finish school or things like, like that. The, the fascinating thing also, which is, um, I'll, and I'll stop with this, if you look over the last 30, 40 years, and I've tracked this with my research and reporting um, throughout this period, the fascinating thing is how uh, volatile identity is. Individuals, when asked, what are you? And you have a list. You're a Jordanian, you're a Beni Hassan, you're a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're a Circassian, you're this, you're that. Uh, or in any Arab country, you can choose your identity. And people in good times, they say, oh, I'm a Jordanian, I'm a Kuwaiti, I'm a Syrian, because they're proud of their country and their country has served them. In bad times, they drop the country and they say, I'm a, I'm a Muslim, I'm a, I'm a Kurd, I'm a Palestinian, I'm a this, I'm a that. So uh, the, the volatility uh, and uh, interchangeability of personal identity in relationship to the state is something we need to keep in mind. And remember, most of these states were created before the citizens were citizens of those states. The states came, the citizens found themselves citizens of the state, the states served their citizens well for 40, 50 years. Uh, and in the last 30, 40 years, they haven't. Uh, 
So when you look at a country like Lebanon or Iraq or Sudan or Algeria now, or others, Tunisia before the ones that had uprisings, this, the, the, the state essentially gave up on most of its citizens and left them to take care of themselves. And in return now, the citizens are basically saying to their states, well, we don't want you either. You got rid of us, we're getting rid of you. So there's this tremendous uh, disjunction between the state and the citizenship, and it can be fixed because people want to live in a normal, dignified society. But it's really hard uh, to do this in stressful times like we're in today. But it's still, it, it can be done if, if, if credible leaderships honestly talk to their people, tell them what's going on, give them voice, give them a chance to participate in decision making provide accountability mechanisms, minimize corruption. Um, it can be done, and it's been done in other countries uh, around the world. So I'm not totally um, uh, despondent. I, you know, when you see in the Arab world incredible dynamism and human, um, not, not just effort that people make, but their desire to live as good citizens in uh, dignified states, that desire is still very strong. Uh, but if it doesn't work, then they'll break away like the Kurds or the South Sudanese or, or this, or they'll create a new state like the Islamic State. They'll just come up with new states. You know, states are like library cards in the Arab world. You can just go and get one if you want or make one. Um, so this is one of the dilemmas that the, the Arab region has to deal with, that statehood has never been fully certified or validated by the citizens of those states. And that's a hard statement to make, I know and people will attack me, but that's okay, I'm, I'm used to it. But certified citizenship and statehood remains the missing element in most of our societies, but it is something that people want, and I, I think it can be achieved. Uh, th thanks a lot, Romy, because you, you, um, you alluded to, a, a, I think, a critical question, that of the state, because we talk about public sector, we talk about society, we talk, but the state is something that we have not discussed enough. I'll come back to that with a question to Tarek in, in a moment. But then, now I, I want to get back to Robert uh, and, and uh, just rebounding on uh, what, what Rami just said, because Rami said you have to explain what you're doing. And, and this is part what leadership is about. I mean, this is what a leader should do when he undergo uh, uh, serious structural reforms. Uh, and, and Hala talked about the importance of leadership as one component of reform. Uh, but I, I would like to link it to something you yourself uh, put forward uh, uh, now uh, uh, when you were talking. Uh, when we talk about leadership also, we're talking about human qualities. And you said something that was really important. You said probably the more uh, difficult reform is that of human resources, uh, which means that you can't have uh, reform if you don't have reformists. Is like, I mean, it's difficult to have democracy if you don't have Democrats, to use a now famous uh, uh, book title. Uh, but when, when we talk about human resource reform, and, and this is one of the questions that I got from the public, what about the quality, quote-unquote, uh, the efficiency of civil servants themselves? Where are these people formed? I mean, they are part of society. They are part of the same society that needs to be reformed. So they are not, by definition, or genetically reformers. How do they become reformers? How do you build a civil service that is reformist? Which leads us to a, I think, structural question in the Arab world, which has to do with education. I mean, isn't probably the first reform we have to tackle in the Arab world, in the MENA region, our educational system? It maybe all starts there. And, and how can we, I mean, build this puzzle between education, civil service as such, good civil servants, and then good reformists and a good reform? How can you build this pyramid up? I Joseph, I think that's an excellent question, and it's one that we grappled with uh, quite a bit uh, when we were at the World Bank. I, I'm not sure we ever cracked it, but we spent a lot of time talking with Tarek and others about, about this. Um, the reality is this is complicated. When Hala was working to back in 2004 and 2006, on reforms in Jordan, it was the Civil Service Bureau that was uh, one of the most resistant to change. And uh, there were all sorts of good ideas 
emanating uh, from the Ministry for Administrative Reform or Development, and they would run up against the Civil Service Board and sort of uh, get shot down. And so it was a very interesting dynamic that was taking place. Um, I, I, I think, let me say there's, there's reasons for hope, and uh, then there's reasons for concern. I, th I think the reasons for hope is we're really confronting a demographic sh shift in the Arab world. I mean, this is a relatively young population. And I've been privileged to work in a number of countries, uh, particularly Saudi Arabia recently. And you really are seeing a sea change in terms of demographics. And, and younger Saudis in their 30s and 40s, often educated abroad, are bringing a whole different set of skills in terms of tech and IT and visions and outlooks and things like that. And I'm sure to, to various degrees that's happening in other countries as well. And so, so, so the good news is, I think we are going to see a generational shift uh, that will be beneficial to the public sector uh, in many of these countries. The, the bad news is um, uh, we looked uh, very closely at issues of productivity and uh, productivity is often you know, very low in, in a number of these countries. And, and it's curious because many countries, particularly in the GCC, make huge investments in developing human capital. So, so this is not an area that they're neglecting in terms of spending money on it. Uh, but for some reason, they just aren't uh, garnering the value uh, out of these investments. And, and I think that's lots of times because within the public sector, where most of these people tend to work, uh, efforts are not made to take full advantage to either develop, groom, and uh, really uh, foster uh, talent within the public sector and utilize it to best advantage to promote it, to reward it, and take it forward. Uh, and I think, you know, looking forward for many countries in the region, if you view public sector performance as, as sort of a Gaussian curve, a probability distribution, uh, the challenge is going to be to focus on two ends of that. Uh, on the high end, uh, a lot more work needs to go into creating senior leadership cotters, just sort of identifying talent, fast-tracking people, uh, you know, working on meritocratic promotion and those sort of sets of things. And that can be done, and there's a number of countries that have done that and have these senior public sector leadership cotters, and they do well. But on the other hand, uh, in many of these countries, virtually no one ever gets fired for non-performance. And I think that that, that creates uh, an ethos or dynamic where, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not good, quite frankly. I mean, productivity uh, lags. Uh, people don't think they need to take the rules seriously because nobody ever gets penalized for it. And so, so when you think about, you know, how do you utilize talent better in the public sector. I, I mean, I, I think it's important to focus on both ends of these distribution curves. And, and if it's difficult to discipline people for cause, which is often the, the hard thing that people struggle with, you know, at, at least start keeping statistics on, you know, what, what the discipline picture is. Uh, what's happening there, so you can get a picture of what's what's going on. Uh, and I think if you focus on both ends of these distribution curves, you'll start getting get better value for the very considerable investment people are making in developing human capital. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see. I see this uh, well. Uh, thank you, Robert. This, this has to do with maybe indirectly with the question I wanted to put to to to, to ask Tari. Uh, about uh, when you talk about, I mean, you know, uh, the lack of uh, accountability for public servants and etc. This explains partly the uh, hypertrophy of, of public uh, public sectors in the Arab world. I mean, you know, this is probably the most uh, humanly packed sector in, in the Arab world, uh, which has to do with the question of size, with the question of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say immobilism and etc. Th this brings me back to what uh, something uh, uh, Tariq alluded to. You said something very interesting, Tariq, before you said, in fact, one of the takeaways is that uh, you, you, you end up knowing and seeing that the Arab, Arab, Arab public sectors are not different from others. I mean, they, they function and dysfunction like any other. So it's not a culturalist reason, and this is dear to my heart. I often uh, tend to fight cultur culturalist explanations in, in the Arab world on, on things functioning or not dysfunction or not functioning enough. 
but then you said uh, probably the main reason is the psyche, the let's say the, the, the lethargy that uh, this kind of hypertrophy of public sectors produce. And this leads us to the question of the state. Uh, Rami alluded to it, uh, state, uh, state uh, uh, statementship and statecraft, state construction. You know, we tend to forget now in the recent debate in political science that something like the state is probably the most important uh, uh, component of the, of the structure, of the construction. We talk about public sector, we, we talk about civil society, all this is very much a la mode. We talk about governance, but we forget that, in fact, like Ted Askokpol said in, in a very famous book some 15 years ago, it's time to bring the state back in. I mean, there is something called the state. And uh, what can we say about the state today when you look at 10 and 15 years of, of public reform attempts? Uh, maybe we have to acknowledge that uh, we don't have strong states in the region, but we have big states in the region. And big is not exactly the same as strong or efficient. It is a big state, sometimes a fat state, and often a fierce state, but not a good state and not a, 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 an efficient state. How can you unpack of the state in, in terms of political science? Joe, so you've raised a lot of uh, profound questions. Big questions, the kind of questions that we could spend uh, an entire day on this webinar trying to sort of deal with. Uh, I want to keep uh, maybe uh, the terminology and the, and, and the concepts here uh, down to earth so I can, I, can, I can relate to what you've said, do justice to it, but also speak to the general public. I would maybe take the last thread of what you suggested by it, it forward, bring it to where we are right now in the region, in the middle of not just a global public health crisis, a pandemic, but uh, as Rami alluded to earlier, uh, this is the biggest economic recession on record in the region. Um, we've not had anything like this in our lifetime or for as long back as uh, maybe 100 years plus. This massive uh, downturn on economic activity coupled with a major public health crisis. I would suggest, Joe, that in fact, in the middle of, of this moment, we've rediscovered the importance of the state. And I've used this phrase before. I think the state has a chance to reassert itself if it makes itself relevant, and if it in fact helps respond to the requirements of the public health crisis, the need for economic recovery subsequently. Uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, it's not a done deal. I don't necessarily think a lot of countries will be able to do that, but the door is wide open for them to, to reassert, the, to gain some legitimacy, reassert their relevance. And we see this in some of the surveys that have come out recently. Uh, case in point, for example, uh, the Arab Barometer Survey was released just a couple of weeks ago. One of its findings surprised me to some extent was trust in government uh, is, is very high in the region higher than it was in 2011, in the middle of a pandemic. And the only explanation one could, could find to try to, 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 to rationalize this is that, in fact, initially, early on in the pandemic, governments performed rather well because the primary goal was to impose lockdowns, closures, to contain the virus. What did they, did, what did they do? They deployed the police the army, the very institutions they had invested the most in over the years. And so maybe people are responding and saying, we trust the government because the government, in fact, in the initial few months of the pandemic delivered. Now, unfortunately, the pandemic is gonna be with us for another year. And the major questions about access to vaccination, the ability to manage a gradual reopening without allowing the virus to uh, wreak havoc, wreak havoc. Uh, but that's where, the, in that complexity, many governments have had problems. Uh, again, the state can, in, in fact, do better. It's being asked to do better. There are expectations for it to do better. Another finding in that survey relating to your question, Joe, which I found fascinating is strong majorities of the public in the region 
want strong leaders. Now, okay, uh, what sort of leaders do they want? Leaders in the public sector, leaders who would deliver on public services, leaders who would bring the rule of law, or perhaps leaders who can respond to this crisis that is ongoing and whose impact is going to be felt for many, many years to come, even after everyone is vaccinated because of the economic carnage it's going to leave behind. Maybe related to this, but more disturbing in my view, is the finding in the survey that very strong majorities in the country surveyed not only want to see strong leaders, they are willing to tolerate and accept sacrificing parliamentary uh, supervision, parliamentary checks and balances in order to empower these leaders. Now, that sounds to me like a, a desire or a willingness to tolerate autocrats, authoritarian leaders. But maybe, Joe, uh, that goes back to your question. That is yet another call for the state to come back in the way Rami put out earlier. The public is is, uh, has recognized, and I think globally, this is not just in the, in the region, that the state has a role to play. There are opportunities for it to consolidate, to strengthen, to reform itself, and to do so uh, at a moment of, uh, of crisis, of despair, of, of, uh, of uh, degradation, uh, and of immense uh, vulnerability. Whether it does that or not, Joe, I think we'll have, we can debate this. I think countries will differ. I worry, and I'll, I'll stop here, I worry, that the post-pandemic Arab world will look uh, even more differentiated uh, from the, the pre-pandemic Arab world. Meaning, we're going to see a lot of disparities, not only within countries, those who have access to education online, those who don't, those who get vaccinated, those who don't, urban versus rural. I think that's likely to happen, uh, but I'm, I'm also more cognizant and, uh, and I recognize the real possibility that differences, disparities between countries are going to widen. The Gulf is going to look very different from countries in, in the Mashriq and, and, and Maghreb. And countries that are in the middle still of political turmoil like Libya, Syria, and Yemen are going to fall further behind. So we'll come back to this debate, Joe, and I look forward to, to you leading us in this direction in, uh, in the next seminar. Inshallah, yes, for sure, Tariq. Um, uh, you, you, uh, just a quick word, you, while you were talking about leaders and strong leaders, authoritarian leaders, this has to do with the debate we had a few minutes ago with Hala about democracy and governance and etc. This is, I think, a, a very interesting finding. Maybe we will, we will shift uh, this to another debate uh, other time, and, and this is a crucial question. I mean, this, this demand both for democracy and efficiency in the Arab world that sometimes can be contradicting. And this is, I think, a very, a very fascinating question. Uh, you, you, you ended up on the issue of, of uh, state resilience, society's re resilience, inequalities, and what, what kind of tension it can produce. Uh, we, we still have uh, 10 minutes left, and I have uh, a question from the audience that seems to me very interesting and related to this. Uh, wh when we talk about uh, state failure, uh, be it in the Mashriq in Syria, maybe in Lebanon, in Iraq, in the Maghreb, in, in, in Libya, and elsewhere, I, in Yemen, in the Gulf, for the Gulf, uh, this is the door open to uh, the, let's say, the uh, the unraveling of authority, the unraveling of law, and probably the rise of violence that is maybe in the beginning social violence, and then it turns out to be political violence and open warfare, like the cases that we know. Uh, if we assume that the Arab world is going to uh, stay for a while at least in a situation of, state, of relative statelessness and, 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 and low level or mid-level violence, the question from the audience is very interesting. Is reform envisageable in countries that uh, coexist with a level of violence? Countries like Iraq, countries like Syria, countries like Yemen, and countries like your country, Tariq, Libya. I mean, is reform, at least a minimal level of reform, envisageable in, in, in such cases? Uh, because we unfortunately have to live with uh, such cases. I will turn.
to each of you for two, three minutes to answer this question. And then unfortunately we'll have uh, to wrap up this webinar. Uh, Hala, would you start please? Sure. Um, I believe any nation, no matter who is ruling, there's a, the issue of social justice is an issue that has to be addressed regardless who is ruling or who is not ruling. I always think there is a way to improve your services. I do hope, to be honest, it's not that easy to say that in these failed state and not, or not even failed state or states with a degree of uh, political... I would think that any kind of ruler, anybody who wants to stay in power or wants power can recognize that reform can make them look better. It is for their political survival. If they look at it as this way, I think it is possible. Um, and social justice, I just want to say, is, is the key issue. I agree with, you know, sometimes it's not just being poor, it's just seeing that you have been unjust. So if they can put a bit of justice in their system, even within that horrible, you know, not really well functioning system, it would do them a, a lot of good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rami? Thank you. I would uh, make the comment that one of the things that we're seeing across the Arab region uh, is the fragmentation of the state and the sharing of sovereignty. So if you look at a country like Lebanon, um, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, um, even stable countries like Egypt, um, Jordan, uh, Morocco, would you find within the uh, superstructure of the state that sovereignty, identity, and even legitimacy internally is a little bit shared among different groups. You have Islamic groups, you have ethnic groups, you have ideological groups, and you have incredible foreign penetration in all of these countries. So the result is that, yes, the answer is even in a war situation, you can have some reform that takes place, but it only serves a small group of people who are part of your constituency because a lot of other people have essentially detached themselves from the state and they're still citizens, they still carry the passport, but they don't look to the central state for their jobs, for their justice, for their uh, protection. They look or for their identity, their voice. They look to their groups. So if we have groups like Hezbollah or the Houthis or the Muslim Brotherhood or uh, ethnic groups, so you know you have Druze and Kurds and uh, so there's all kinds of other identities besides the state. Um, and the and the link to that is that the issue which we haven't mentioned is the issue of sovereignty. These are independent states, but most of them are not sovereign. Most Arab countries cannot buy any military equipment they want without getting the approval of Israel or the United States. It's incredible, but this is the reality. Um, most Arab states, not all of them, most of them don't control their borders fully. Uh, and we've seen it with the military interventions all over the place. Uh, so sovereignty, these are independent but not fully sovereign states. And this is a, a, a problem because it creates all of these multiple identities and multiple uh, allegiances and multiple service delivery uh, centers. So I think what Tara said is there is a demand for strong leadership to recreate effective states. Uh, people like the states that were moving in the 60s and 70s were building schools and creating jobs and creating national airlines. People like that and then they want more of it. Okay, thank you. Robert, two minutes. No, you're muted, Rob. Yeah, you, two minutes and three points. So let's see if I can do it. Uh, number one, uh, can you do reforms in difficult situations? Yes. I, I think we're privileged to have a case with Salam Fayyad. Uh, if you look at what he was able to accomplish as Minister of Finance in Palestine, it was really very impressive. Uh, and it starts when he and uh, Yasser Arafat are sheltering in a bunker from an Israeli incursion in Ramallah. So, so, so messy situation, uh, but if you have talented leaders who have an opportunity, and he was, I think, in some respects, uniquely gifted, it can be done. That's the good news. Uh, 
Um, two, I, I think in the MENA region, it's complicated. And this goes to the point that Hala made about values and Rami talked about identification. Uh, and um, I was privileged to work in Central and Eastern Europe right after the wall came down. And it had a couple of things going for it. I, I mean, you had large uh, social consensus, a large uh, sense of legitimacy that these countries didn't want, you know, didn't like communism. They'd been there, they'd seen that, they'd done that. It wasn't where they wanted to go. They wanted some form of parliamentary democracy and social market economy. And that was broadly shared across 80 or 90% of the population. And so you could quibble about how far to take the social safety net. You could argue about how quickly to go with privatization, but they knew the general direction that the country wanted to go. When you, you looked at polling data on Egypt in the wake of the Arab Spring, uh, it was much more fragmented. I mean, do they want to move in the direction of Saudi Arabia, Turkey, which looked better at that point than it does today, uh, China, uh, France, or the UK? Um, and so one of the key questions is going to be how you can get a sense of uh, agreement, social agreement, on the optimal form of organization from which you de devise or derive the legal framework and institutional framework for your state. And, and here, in closing on sort of a moderately upbeat note, I, I'm drawn to the example of Dubai. Now, you know, those who look closely at Dubai, it's a more complicated story. But I think in many parts of the Arab world, it's, you know, it's looked to as a beautiful gleaming city that in some respects works. And, you know, there's all sorts of questions about participation and democracy and voice and regulatory framework and things like that. But, but um, and I think that that's probably going to be, to be uh, sort of the next step is you, if you can get some consensus on, you know, the, uh, some degree of political organization that may be more authoritarian than all of us would like, but still uh, holds a vision out there. You take that and then you think about the more complicated tasks about uh, participation and, and uh, democratization and those sorts of those sorts of challenges. Yeah, thank you, Tarek. I, I will I will leave the floor to you uh, to uh, to answer the question, but also as a co-host of of this event and the co-author of the book to close it and uh, and say the final word. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with you on on anything, pretty much. Uh, so I look forward to us working it again together on many many uh, fronts. Um, uh, Hala and Robert uh, reminded me of, of one of the quotes attributed to Salam Fayyad in the book, uh, where he was trying to get across the idea that reforms have to be tangible for people. You have to make them real. They have to feel them. Uh, they have to see them. Even if by nature, some of these reforms are you know, behind the scenes taking place and they're about processes and, and, uh, and issues and, uh, that people may never observe. And, and so the quote, attributed to Salam Fayyad is uh, people cannot eat reform. Meaning if you're going to be embarking on, 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 uh, on, on a reform project, you have to keep in mind that ultimately this has, uh, has to relate uh, to people's needs in the ways uh, that, that Rami suggested repeatedly today. Uh, I want to take the opportunity, obviously, Joe, to thank you for uh, co-hosting this with us and for providing the, 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 uh, the exemplary uh, moderation that you did. I want to thank, especially here in this regard, your colleague and my colleague, our our collective mentor, I'd say, Rami Khouri, for really pushing this agenda and championing it over the years. Uh, it was back in 2002, 2003, uh, in the dark days post-9-11, the, the, post where many of us were struggling to sort of make sense of, of things that Rami became incredibly important in a lot of the work that emerged on governance, a lot of the work that was produced, uh, analytical, the, uh, conceptual, and a lot of the awareness and dissemination activities. So he's, he's put 20 years at least in this project. And in fact, for that reason, Joe, he wrote the preface for the edited volume that you kept on referring to it today, a very precious preface. It's by Rami Khouri. Uh, I think this book is as much about the reformers in the, in the, in the, who did the, the, you know, the, the heavy lifting as it is about the people who inspired them. And for me, Rami Khouri is on top of this list and I just want to thank him and extend uh, a debt of, you know, 
my appreciation appreciation and our collective appreciation on behalf of all of us. So thank you, Rami, and thank you, Joe, again for hosting this this wonderful event. Thank you very much, Tarek, for your words. It's really, uh, I mean, uh, really a pleasure to work with you, and I, I'm sure that we will do it again. And and Rami is is probably going to be the constant. Uh, broker of, of all of all these nice ideas. I would like also to thank Robert for his uh, participation and his 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 uh, participation to the book also. But mainly also to thank uh, Minister Latou for the the great honor that we had in hosting her. I hope that we will be able to benefit from your insights again uh, at IFI and uh, probably at Brookings, and maybe uh, I have a few ideas of, of things that we can do together in the coming period, uh, because this is an open uh, subject. I don't think that we have uh, closed it today. The questions are more numerous than the, than, than the answers, and probably this question is going to live with us for a while, and we'll get back to this uh, thematic. I thank the public. We had a very good audience today. We have uh, more than uh, 140 40 uh, participants or auditors or, or, or people who attended this webinar. This was a pleasure. It, uh, it soothes uh, confinement and, and renders it more, uh, more soft and more livable. I thank you all. I wish you a good evening and uh, see you soon again. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.